Hi, I'm Sarah Backhouse for Hub Culture. We're here at the Governor's Global Climate Summit and I'm joined by Dr. Thomas Becker. Welcome, Thomas. Welcome. Hi. Tell me a little bit about your role as the Corporate and Governmental Affairs Liaison at BMW. Well, I mean, uh, today the car industry, the way we make cars are to a very large extent shaped by the requirements of society and by the regulator. So my function is on one side to stay in touch with all those who have a, this decisive kind of an impact on our industry and on the other hand also to serve as a kind of information interface, a kind of a radar for what is coming uh, in kind of expectations, requirements from our societal environment. Can you give me a, a timeline of some key policies that have shaped the auto industry and, and how it's, where it's going in the future? I mean, if you look back to the 70s, I think what you could see was the massive influence of the safety issue and of the first wave of emission abatement uh, requirements. And there, California was one of the main drivers. Uh, we then have seen uh, the CO2, the fuel efficiency discussion, again, strongly driven by California, but also with a very strong role of the European legislator now also of the US federal government. But if you look at the next stages, which is uh, shaping a new form of, form of mobility around the electric drivetrain, I would expect uh, China to play a very significant role in addition to the traditional car-making nations, which is the US, Europe and Japan. I guess air quality being so poor in China, they really have an impetus to get a head start on that. Absolutely, and congestion is another hot topic. If you look at Beijing with a thousand new registrations a day, and uh, looking at the fact that a few years after the Olympics where they have been building uh, massive additional motorways, you almost get stuck more, more or less all of the day. They will take action uh, in order to manage that. Can you tell me about some of the other car lines that you have? Because I think people aren't often familiar, for example, that Rolls-Royce is one of your properties and, and right. that's actually a very green car. Yeah, the Rolls-Royce is uh, obviously not a, a high-figure, high-volume product. Uh, but it is one where, uh, if you look at our plant in Goodwood in Great Britain, uh, we have built up a completely new manufacturing facility which is uh, defined uh, by the need to do it as sustainable as possible. Uh, so we are located uh, in, on the estate of uh, the Earl of March, uh, who also required us to really have a top-of-the-line management of these effects. And if you look at the uh, the, the lawn that we have uh, on the roof of the building, if you look at all the water management, the energy management, uh, the Rolls-Royce is a car which is made with minimized environmental impact. What are some of the key environmental initiatives that are important to BMW right now? For us, obviously, uh, uh, the crucial challenge is uh, to mobilize additional 25 to 30 percent of fuel efficiency uh, enhancement between 2008 and 2020. Uh, that comes on top of uh, roughly 29% that we have already been reducing since the mid-90s. So one can say that compared to that situation, the BMW, average BMW in the year 2020 will only consume less than half uh, of what it did uh, in the mid-90s. So this only is possible with a massive investment into new technologies and technologies which you do not only implement in very selective few products, but which you really implement across the entire breadth of your product spectrum. What are some of the biggest challenges facing BMW as far as sustainability is concerned? For us, uh, very clearly, as for most of the rest of the industry, it is about, um, on one side, doing big investments uh, into new groundbreaking technologies, and on the other hand, uh, remaining profitable uh, in a sustainable manner with the existing product portfolio. So what we talk about is not a situation where you just uh, uh, turn a switch uh, and go from one technology to another, but we talk about managing a transi transition process, a situation where you have a competition between very different drivetrains, very different fuels, biofuels, hydrogen, natural gas, electricity, uh, and you have to manage all of that. And we have limits of our own responsibility. So we cannot, for example, influence the environmental footprint of the way biofuels or electricity is generated. Sure. But all of this impacts on the way customers perceive these technologies. Mm. So we need the collaboration with governments, with other stakeholders uh, in the upstream sectors in order to uh, have a framework where people make the right choices uh, and feel certain that they're doing the right thing. And much of this certainty is something we cannot provide them with but here we need partners uh, outside of the automotive industry. 
And finally, speaking about legislation, what are your hopes for COP16? Well, what we have been seeing in, uh, in Copenhagen last year, where, frankly speaking, also I personally would have expected another outcome, is that uh, global agreement is difficult to reach as long as you do not have a joint understanding of the role of the global agreement as such. So this is a, a challenging, uh, challenging process, which I would not think will deliver very quick results. But BMW is going to be part of the Copenhagen event. We are going to be uh, presenting and discussing our findings uh, on electric mobility, which we have generated together with UC Davis uh, here in California, in order to contribute in concrete terms to solutions to the issue. So this is the role that we can play. The very big diplomatic arena uh, is uh, not where we have an influence on, but we can show that there are ways and means uh, of tackling the issues. Dr. Thomas Becker, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the uh, conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.